And welcome back to the Chronicles of Triple S. Triple S here. Um, something very exciting is going to happen. Uh, maybe in a few hours. I have to actually look up the time when it's going to happen. But we're just about to have the in-flight abort test for um, SpaceX's Dragon crew capsule. Which is like the last test before they start putting astronauts to go to the International Space Station for the first time since the... Uh, there was one launch after the Columbia disaster, Space Shuttle Discovery. Um, and that was a, few, a couple of years ago, I guess. Um, this is just about to start. It's scheduled for uh, uh, a minute or so. Um, tomorrow, they're going to actively destroy a a never launched Dragon 9 um, it's going to be very exciting it's going to be so exciting uh, I'll just look up uh, when they're going to be actually doing that tomorrow today sometime today home Ariane launched 19 hours away from now so 19 hours for 2 o'clock which is 2100 hours which is 9pm Perth time so it's going to be Saturday, Saturday night entertainment uh, honestly, I can't wait. It's just going to be absolutely spectacular. I mean, I I'm lost without words. It's going to be that good. Just make sure I've got all my stuff. Sony amp. We should be going live in less than two minutes. A space a Falcon 9 will launch will launch carrying a brand new crew dragon capsule and will simulate a failure was flying through Max Q. Max Q for those who don't know what Max Q is uh is the most aerodynamic pressure on a rocket. It's usually in the in the upper atmosphere where it's still thick enough to have an effect on the on the rocket itself, um, but the rocket is going supersonic. Um, beyond that point, the air gets thinner. The rocket still keeps going faster, but the air gets thinner. So the uh, stresses on the on the vehicle reduce. Demonstrate the spacecraft's ability to escape in the event of catastrophic failure of the launch vehicle. Um, if you, everyone remembers the space shuttle, um, it had seven people on board, but only two ejection seats, and they soon got rid of them. I, I don't know if they didn't want to play favourites anymore, <laughs> or uh, hmm, with the Challenger disaster, you could actually see um, the tip of the space shuttle with the seven astronauts on board um, flying through the air um, would have been nice to just maybe put some parachutes on that um, but who really knows if they were alive at that time but um, this is going to be a phenomenal 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 thing Just while we're waiting for that quickly, I'll see if I can bring up the uh, the first um, Dragon Abort. They did this some time ago now. It was uh, a couple of years ago.
might be a little bit hard to uh, find this video in the face of all the others that are, that are very recent. Paderborn test, here it is. This is the uh, original one that they did back in 2005. Five years ago now. That today's uh, the only abort test that they've actually run that will, that has flown through the sky. They have done numerous rocket tests of their Vulcan rockets. I think they're Vulcan. Um, the Vulcan rockets actually run on hypergolic fuels, so they don't need a starter. They just need to be in contact with each other to explode and race out one end. Two o three. Just going to check back for the pre-launch conference. We're only a few minutes late. So hopefully they'd never have to use this. Um. Still nothing. Still nothing. Surely they actually had something on this just before. Oh, 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 we have music. Sorry, this isn't live, but um, might as well show this while we're waiting for the conference to start up. My name is Lauren Lyons. I'm an engineer in our flight reliability department here at SpaceX. And I'm so excited to be here with you today. Along with my co-pilot host, bringing you coverage of the first ever test flight of Falcon Heavy. At liftoff, Falcon Heavy is going to be the world's most powerful operational rocket by a factor of two. And today is the day that we attempt to demonstrate that power. And because it is. Good afternoon, thanks for joining us. We're here today to talk more about the SpaceX in flight abort test, a part of NASA's commercial crew program. The test is good. NASA and SpaceX completed a launch readiness review yesterday, and to talk more about that review and the mission, I'm pleased to be joined by program manager of the commercial crew program, Kathy Leaders, Benji Reed, director of Crew Mission Management at SpaceX, and Mike McElwain, Launch Weather Officer from the 45th Weather Squadron. 
We're going to begin today with opening questions from each of our speakers, and then we're going to turn it over uh, to questions here from the audience. You can also ask a question uh, using uh, the phone bridge. Also, we have Ask NASA if you're following along on social media. And so we'll get to those questions after opening comments. And to kick us off, we'll start with Kathy. So first of all, I really appreciate the great turnout. It's almost like launch day. But one of the first things I want to say is um, this isn't like launch day. Um, what's different about it? Well, on launch day, we're really hoping for it not to be exciting. Um, I will tell you tomorrow will be an exciting day. Um, you know, we, we are purposely failing a launch vehicle to make sure that our abort system on the spacecraft that will be flying for our crews works. And so that's a very, very different way for us to normally conduct a mission. So this is a very important test. Another thing that, um, unfortunately for the folks that will be standing around waiting for us to launch, it's not an instantaneous launch window. So, you know, we'll be um, getting ready to do the test when it's the right time to do the test for all the logistics that needs to work to make sure that we're getting the test data and then also to make sure we can recover the spacecraft and get the import important information that's being captured on the spacecraft too. So, um, so you all may be waiting for a while while we're trying to find the, the perfect time for us to be able to conduct this test. Um, you know, third thing that's a little bit different is, uh, you know, our demonstration missions and the DM-1 demonstration mission was under the TCAP contract. Um, I don't know if people realize, but this is our last open milestone under our ICAP Space Act agreement. And uh, because of that, we're, this is an FAA licensed test launch. And so um, this has been a great practice session for us. Um, our next uh, mission, the crewed mission, will be another uh, NASA launch. But following that, we'll be needing to do FAA licensed missions for our post-certification missions. And so this has been a really great learning experience for us to continue to work through all the things we need to continue to work through for our crew transportation missions coming up. Another great um, way we've been able to use the running up to this test is uh, we were conducting a dry dress. Um, today we um, have been practicing how we would go and actually with the launch vehicle on the day of a launch, a crewed launch, we bring our crews up and make sure the timing and everything works. And so you can see pictures from our, our dry dress test rehearsal today where we had uh, Bob and Doug, you know, practicing what will soon be their step that they'll be going through as they go and actually enter the uh, Dragon spacecraft and making sure that um, we are getting ready for that crewed launch. So in conclusion, this is a big test for us. This is a, a test of a system that's supposed to protect the crews and, and we're very happy that SpaceX has taken a very, you know, challenging test platform to be able to do that. Um, but it's a very important step in us making progress towards crewed transportation to the International Space Station. So thank you for being here. And we'll go to Benji. Great. Um, thank you uh, for having me here, and um, it's you know it's it's always an honor and it's truly a humbling experience getting to work um, on the commercial crew program, and being part of um, you know the effort to return uh, American launch uh, capability for astronauts, um, and uh, the opportunity to work with NASA and all of our partners is is, is always outstanding. Um, as Kathy talked about, this test is uh, uh, very important to us. It's really the culmination of years um, of, of work together, of close partnership with NASA. Um, we've been developing the crew transportation system, which really is a complete system. It's always an important thing to remember. It's, it's the, the Falcon and the Dragon. It's the ground systems. It's the operators. It's all the hardware, all the software. It all goes into it together. And today, or tomorrow's test is one of those things that's going to actually let us test that whole system end to end. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the things that's going to be exciting um, and, and, and a very good, a good practice and a good thing that we need to go to. Um, as I mentioned, this is you know the culmination of, of a lot of work and a lot of tests that brought us to today. Um, you know, back in 2015, we did a pad abort test. This was uh, a similar idea, right? The idea is, is that you've got the crew in the capsule; they're safely tucked in. They're 
they're in their seats, uh, their, their capsule's closed, but something's gone wrong with the rock that are onto the pad, and you want to be able to get them away um, quickly. Um, and so we practiced that about five years ago um, in the Dragon capsule to make sure that the kind of the proof of concept of, the, of this launch escape system would work, um, and that worked very well. Um, and now, fast forward here to, to tomorrow, um, the plan will be to basically do the same thing. Dragon is on top of the rocket. The rocket will take off. At about 84 seconds into launch, we'll trigger the launch escape system. Um, and and that, then Dragon will carry the astronauts safely away, um, carry the capsule tomorrow safely away from the Falcon. In the event that there were astronauts on board, that's the whole goal. Um, and that's the main objective of this test, is to show that we can carry the astronauts safely away um, from the rocket in case anything's going wrong. Um, I mentioned that we're, we're triggering this test at about 84 seconds, um, and, and as we you know, kind of hit the sweet spot of conditions that we think is the right place to test in, the reality is that there are many, many triggers and many different points in time um, where the launch escape system could initiate um, in order to keep the, the crew safe at any point um, in the whole trajectory. Um, as we recall, there was a, um, just uh, not long ago last year, there was a, an event on Soyuz um, where they needed to use their launch, uh, their, their escape system um, in ascent on the way to orbit. Um, and so it really drives home the point of, of why we need to be able to have these systems. Um, SpaceX originally proposed doing this test um, because we thought that it was important to do. And we still do, and it's one of the key steps that we get to before we go to our Demonstration 2 mission, which will carry Bob and Doug up um, to, this, to the space station. Um, the road to getting here um, over the last uh, many years has included many things, um, including that Demo 1 test. Um, that was the first time an American vehicle has autonomously docked to the space station, um, and, uh, and we brought the vehicle home safely. Um, we've also done um, over 700 tests of our Super Draco engines. The Super Dracos are the engines that are embedded in Dragon. They're um, integral to the propulsion system of Dragon, and they're the things that are used for the launch escape. So tomorrow we get to see those Super Dracos fire again, just like we did five years ago um, at the pad abort, and again, over 700 tests over the last number of years. Um, and we also, this same Dragon is the one that, that we did a static fire test on in November. That's where we held Dragon down. And, uh, and initiated those Super Dracos, basically um, simulating the test that we're going to do tomorrow, but in this case, keeping Dragon held down to make sure that, uh, that the Super Dracos and, the su and that system would work. Beyond that, there's been thousands of other tests of the propulsion system um, and many, many hundreds of tests of other subsystems on the vehicle, including our life support systems um, and others um, that are key overall to getting Bob and Doug to the station and bringing them home safely and proving the system out and certifying the system to become an operational transportation system um, for astronauts and for the National Space Station. Um, at this point, I think we should go to uh, the slide. Um, as I mentioned, as we already talked about already, the, uh, the launch window opens up tomorrow at 8 a.m. Um, and it's about a four hour launch window. Um, uh, this is a test, and uh, as Kathy mentioned, it's not an instantaneous window, so things could happen at a lot of point in time in that window we decide when we decide to go. In fact, we're already looking at possibly extending the launch window um, just to maximize flexibility of opportunity. Um, a little bit about the weather, and we'll get a, an actual weather briefing here, but to understand some of the constraints um, and how these play together is important. Um, it's really an integrated problem when you look at the weather in this situation. Right? It's not just about the launch and the ascent of the launch vehicle, but in this case, we also need to consider um, what the weather is doing for the abort. Um, we want to make sure that we're ready to be able to safely abort and also safely recover the vehicle um, when we get to the ocean. So we have to look at things like wave height and wind speeds as well for that, for those purposes. Um, you know, one of the things I want to mention is if you look at the slide in the bottom part of it, it mentions that. Uh, um, that this Falcon has flown many times, and this is kind of exciting. I don't know, Kathy, if you knew this or not, but um, the Falcon that's flying tomorrow has flown three times before. Tomorrow will be its fourth flight, and this is the first uh, Falcon Block 5. So Block 5 Falcon was a major upgrade to Falcon that we did in order to carry crew um, and to, to become human rated, human space flight rated, and this is the first vehicle that flew in the Block 5 configuration and it's going to refly tomorrow for this test for the commercial crew program. And as another interesting point, uh, our launch that we're planning uh, later this week um, for Starlink is actually going to fly the same Falcon that flew Demo 1 um, as well. So have some fun little trivia there too. Um, we'll go to the next slide. 
it's, it's a, a good vehicle. vehicle. Uh, Kathy already talked about this, and I, I think it's super important to, to understand and um, the, the value of this test is not just in, in doing the launch abort uh, or the, the launch escape system test, right? There's a huge amount of work that goes into this. Um, one of the things you want to do, and as I mentioned, you know, this is a whole system. And part of that system are all the people who are operating, whether it's the, the astronauts like Bob and Doug, as you see on the screen, um, or, uh, you know, all of the, the hundreds of people who are working at NASA and at SpaceX to operate um, the vehicles and ensure safety. Um, and so we want to practice, practice, practice. We want to test like we fly, and we want to practice like we fly. And the great thing about doing this test, aside from the main objective of the proving out the launch escape system, is we get to do all of that. So um, in the lead up to this, um, we did that dry dress today. That went very well. Um, and it's not just that the crew gets suited up and, uh, and, and goes out to the pad, goes up the tower, goes all they walk all the way out to the Dragon. We got to time that. We actually ran it without any stops. We wanted to make sure that the timing that we've been practicing for the last many months is accurate, and it was. Um, we learned some lessons. We take some notes. We apply them to make sure that launch day with crew will work very well. But we also get to have all of um, the operators on console. So the operators were on console early, early this morning. Um, some folks were there at 1 a.m. Um, you know, starting up the whole process of getting ready to go. Um, and they get to practice that whole process of what it's going to be like to have the crew board Dragon. Um, and then tomorrow is the same idea. Not only is this a test of the launch escape system, but everybody gets to practice, practice the process of launching crew. Um, on that note, we will be loading um, the Falcon the same way, loading the propellant on the Falcon the same way that we will load um, on the crew missions. We've actually done that a number of times on previous flights. We'll continue that process of doing, um, of doing crew loading on the crew uh, configuration loading um, on Falcon. Um, and, and just to kind of reiterate what that looks like, right? So ultimately, the crew goes up into, like I mentioned, they go up the tower, they go into the crew arm, they get into the Dragon, they get into their seats, they get all plugged in. Um, we shut the, shut the hatch, they're safe and sound. About two minutes before we start propellant loading on Falcon, um, we arm the launch escape system. And this is a key point, right? So the crew is in there, they're safe and sound. We, we arm the launch escape system, um, and then we start propellant loading on Falcon. Propellant loading takes about 30 minutes, and then we launch. And the idea here is we're minimizing exposure to crew, both the astronauts and also the ground crew, and everybody who's supporting them, um, to, uh, to, to the actual process of having propellants loaded on the rocket and during that propellant loading time. We'll get to practice that again tomorrow. Um, overall, for uh, the test timeline, um, you know, we're, again, tests like you fly, everything else will go just about as we would expect to um, on launch day with crew. Um, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide and see um, an animation, I think is what's next. Great. So this is uh, an animation of what we expect it to look like tomorrow. Um, so we'll take off um, and uh, launch the rocket about 84 seconds in. Um, at about 19 kilometers out and about 20 kilometers high, I'm sorry, about four kilometers out and about 19 kilometers high, um, we'll initiate the launch uh, escape system. Dragon will leave the Falcon very quickly. Um, it will then um, hit an apogee of about 20 kilometers, about 40 kilometers high. Um, it'll jettison the trunk. It'll reorient itself with the Draco engines, and then it'll continue its trajectory down. And about five minutes after launch, the parachutes will deploy, and about 10 minutes after launch, we expect splashdown. Splashdown will occur probably around 30, 35 kilometers off of shore, depending a little bit on winds. Um, that's really it. You know, I, again, it's an honor, and it's always a humbling experience, as I mentioned, to do this, to be part of this, to, to work with the crew, getting to sit with them this morning in our debrief after the the dry dress is very important um, to all of us to understand that we're really getting ready to go, getting ready to fly. Um, and I, I just I want to thank again, of course, NASA and the Commercial Crew Program, Kennedy Space Center, the 45th Space Wing, the FAA, and all the different agencies and groups that we get to work with all the time to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Benji. And Mike. All right, well, um, I'm sorry to say yesterday was probably the last 80 degree winter day we're going to have for a while. Uh, the upper level ridge we had in place has uh, kind of broken down last night. If you were up at midnight uh, helping the crew, we uh, saw a little front go through, a little bit of rain showers, and that just indicates that that ridge has really broke down. 
If we go to the satellite, you can see uh, that next frontal system ginning up in Texas. That's a couple days out, but that's what's going to uh, bring winter into Florida finally. We uh, got some pretty gusty wind behind that front that you can see draped over the uh, Bahamas and southern Florida. And that's what's uh, causing some uh, gusty winds out there right now. It's also going to generate some higher waves. That's going to slowly diminish tomorrow, but early on, that's really the main concern. If we go to the launch forecast. Okay, so this is um, typical launch forecast, 10% uh, chance. You think that's great, right? Man, that's hardly anything of a violation. But that is only for the launch portion. There's a lot of things that have to come together uh, for recovery. That's not included in the launch forecast. Um, you mentioned waves and winds. Uh, we want to take some pictures and make sure everything happens. So that's uh, cloud cover. So we're trying to find a time that has launch weather lining up with recovery weather. And uh, tomorrow, it gradually uh, improves on the recovery weather uh, through the day. So um, you might be sitting around for a while waiting for that, that wind and waves to, to die down a little bit over the water. But it will gradually come down. Go to the next slide, 24 hour. I can tell you that recovery weather is great. Uh, very light winds and very low waves. Unfortunately, um, that front is moving into uh, the panhandle of Florida, and we're going to see a lot of upper level clouds uh, moving into our area. <clears throat> you can see uh, that's not good for optics, and it's not too good for launch weather. So through the four hour window, you're going to see the probability of violation for launch weather increase. Uh, from 50 to 60 percent. So later in the window is bad so if we go to Sunday. Later in the window is good for all those things coming together for Saturday. Now if we go to the 48 hour delay, um, recovery weather is starting to look okay in the morning but it gets worse in the afternoon as the winds pick up which is when the launch weather gets a little better. Okay so we got the front moving out so the clouds are going to dissipate through the countdown or through the launch window and we're looking better towards the end of the window than the beginning, but that's the opposite of what's happening out uh, over the water. So it's, uh, it's a nice dance between launch weather, uh, optics, winds, and waves offshore. So we're trying to find a time where all those things match up, and we don't have the perfect day just yet, but uh, we'll find it, and we'll make sure we only go when, it, when it's ready and everything's lining up. Thanks. And thank you, Mike. And we'll now turn it over to questions. We'll start with those in the room. We also have people following along on social media, so you can use the hashtag AskNASA, and we also have a phone bridge. Uh, for now, since we have a lot of questions, we'll stick it to one per reporter, and then if we can get back around, so please state your name and affiliation as we go around as well. That'd be great. And we'll start at the front of the room with Marsha. Um, hello, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press for Benji. Um, how close is this dragon to the real deal, and will Ripley or another mannequin be along for the ride? That's a great question. Um, this is a crew dragon, um, and so we, we've, we've built it and developed it just like we would uh, a full crew vehicle that we'd fly crew on. The only difference is that it doesn't include all of um, the components or systems that you don't need in there. Like, we haven't fully built out the interior, for example, right? But it has all of the equipment that you need in there. Um, and yes, there are other uh, anthropomorphic test devices, as we call them, um, basically that are, that, that are human shaped and, and, and human mass that sit in the seats. And we've got two of them in there with sensors in the seats to make sure that we really do understand the forces that are going on. It, it's important to remember that this is um, specifically a system designed to keep people safe and bring them home safely and, 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 and have some sense of what they're going to be going through and the comforts that they're going to be seeing. We expect them to feel no more than about four Gs of force um, when, when they go through the launch abort. Uh, Bill Hartley, CBS News for Benji. Uh, can you walk us through maybe a little finer detail on uh, when the abort gets triggered? Do the Falcon 9's engine, first of all, is it computer commanded or is it ground commanded? Do the engines shut down on the Falcon 9 before the abort takes place or after? And, do you, and when, you, when, the, when you lose propulsion on the, on the first stage, I'm assuming the vehicle aerodynamically comes apart, so I was wondering if you expect fuel mixing flame in the sky, and finally, I realize this is all one question, right? Um, <laughs> is, is, is the second stage, uh, is that fully fueled? Is there an engine in the second stage, and what's its configuration? Thanks. That, that, that's great, and you, you set me up for all of the good answers, so <laughs> it was really good. Um, no, so um, that, that, that's it's a really great question. How, how does it go through? So um, the triggers are set. It's about 84 seconds. We've preset this trigger. Um, um, intentionally, because again, we kind of want to hit the sweet spot of where we think we get the, the, the most effective data out of this test. Um, what will happen basically is it will we'll launch abort, uh, we'll initiate the launch escape, 
um, and the Falcon engines will shut down. Um, so the, the thrust on the Falcon will shut down right after that happens. Um, when that happens, Dragon at the same time will be getting away. Um, it takes about 10 seconds for Super Draco burn um, on, the, on the Dragon. Um, Dragon will hit about 2.3 Mach, Mach 2.3 um, uh, as it's getting away. We expect it to be actually quite far away from Falcon um, at the speed that it's acceleration that it's going um, before, um, before anything starts to happen on, on Falcon. But that's a fairly quick process. So fairly quickly as well, Falcon will be going through a lot of aerodynamic um, you know, issues. Basically, the, the, Fal the Dragon will have left, so the, the, the top end of um, the second stage is now basically a big air scoop. Right, and so you've got all this air pushing against it, a huge amount of force pushing against it. It's also cut thrust, so it's not, no longer pushing up in a, in a trajectory. It's, it's going to be a lot more susceptible to the winds and starting to fall um, as, it, as, it, as it loses its velocity um, and start to tumble. At some point, we expect then that the Falcon will, um, will start to break up. Um, and yes, both stages are loaded with fuel um, because we want to have the right mass and do all the right, the test the right way. So with those both stages loaded with fuel, we do expect there'll probably be some amount of ignition, flame. We'll see something. On a clear day, um, possibly from the ground, you could see it. Um, but, uh, but we do expect it to break up. Um, our Falcon 9 recovery forces will be um, standing by, um, ready to go and recover as much of the as Falcon as we can and safely as possible. Um, the key thing, though, to think about is while that's going on, and that'll be the exciting part of the day that Kathy mentioned, that we don't want to have that kind of excitement normally. Um, well, Dragon will also be doing its thing, and that's what we'll be particularly focused on, is getting Dragon over through Apogee, Trunk Jettison, and then on to Parachute Deploy and Recovery. And the Dragon Recovery Forces will also be out there. One thing I didn't mention um, earlier, and I think it's a good point, is, is that when Dragon splashes down, um, we'll be approaching the vehicle within a few minutes. Um, but uh, the Detachment 3, DET 3, which is part of the Air Force, um, who is on call for emergency recovery for the vehicle. Our, for, our, our recovery team will recover um, the astronauts and Dragon when um, in a normal recovery situation when they're coming home from space station. But any kind of a contingency recovery event, um, for example, in a, in a launch escape situation, um, DET-3 will go out um, with their uh, pair jumpers and will actually go and recover the capsule for us. So they're going to be with us tomorrow. They're going to be practicing. It's another great example of the kind of practice and testing that we get. So we're going to practice with them and they'll spend about an hour um, doing practice and uh, with our team and, 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 and around the vehicle as part of the recovery tomorrow. Uh, there is not a second state engine. Thanks. Um, Irene Clouds with Aviation Week um, for Benji. Um, one quick follow-on with Bill's list. Um, does the automated flight termination system have any role in what's going to be happening tomorrow? And then I was curious, this flight originally was going to be nine months ago, and obviously there was a need to prepare a second vehicle, but was there anything else that drove um, the nine-month uh, uh, schedule slip? Thanks. Sure. Um, I, that's a good question. So in, in terms of... Um, I. Like I'll answer, the, I guess, the second, first part of the question. Repeat that one for me. Automated, automated flight, yeah. So the FTS, the automated flight termination system. For the FTS, um, that will be armed, um, of course. We're launching um, a rocket, and we want to make sure that, um, that we're going to keep, you know, the public safe as well as part of what the FTS is there for. Um, and that will be armed, um, but we um, don't expect it to um, have to, you know, be triggered at all. And in, in, in the event, there's an interesting point, too, as a test, we do have the launch escape system armed. Um, and, and so if something else were to go wrong that we weren't planning at 84 seconds, um, Dragon will still launch escape beforehand and, and we'll, still get, we'll, we'll still be able to see the launch escape system perform. Um, and the FTAs would, would, if it had to be used, it would be used after that. Um, in terms of the schedule, the, the, the biggest change was, of course, you know, we had the anomaly when we did our Dragon static fire in the spring. Um, and so we needed to go back and absolutely, number one, understand what happened in that anomaly um, and, and, and understand everything there and make sure that we had mitigated it and implemented all of those changes, um, which we've done. The, uh, that anomaly report is complete, um, and we've actually filed that with all the various agencies, um, and so that's, that's good to go. Um, it, it really, the schedule was about doing that, going through the investigation process, filing the investigation report, getting that completed, um, and then also building the, taking the vehicle, kind of moving ahead in our vehicle build flow. 
um, because what we had is we have a, we always have a number of dragons in build at any given point in time. And so we just moved ahead one dragon that we had originally planned to fight on Demo 2. We moved into the infight at Orc. The one that we had originally planned um, for our first operational mission is now the Demo 2 vehicle. So we just moved them ahead of flow. But of course, that takes some time to, to get those built out. Hi, I'm Jim Siegel. I'm with NASA Tech. And by the way, thank you for that animation earlier. That was very helpful, I thought. Uh, I have a question about uh, the criteria uh, down in the, in the landing site. So wh what are the criteria that you're going to be using, uh, like wave height and temperature and wind? And are there other criteria besides that that you'll be looking at tomorrow? It's, you know, it's a combination of all of those. And I, and I don't know the thresholds off the top of my head for the specifics in terms of the weather. Um, but um, it, 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 it is particularly, you know, you're looking at you're looking at cloud cover for sure. We want to have, make sure that we have enough visibility. Um, the point of this test is to gather as much data as we can. And so we, um, we're actually going to have a number of assets, ground and air-based assets, gathering video um, of this. And we want to make sure that they have clear sight um, as well. Um, and then there's also, there is waves, and you want to understand, you know, wave height and, and, uh, and just ground wind speed as well, as well as um, wind speed as you're moving up through the trajectory. Lauren Gresh at The Verge. Um, adding on to that, so in the future, in, let's say, un unfortunately, a la launch abort has to happen. What is the most extreme kind of conditions that the Crew Dragon could land in? I know you guys want good conditions for this test, but what wave heights could you handle, and would that be a factor in when you launch in the future? Um, that's a really good question, um, and it's, it's kind of a question you should be helping develop our launch commit criteria <laughs> because it's it's a, it's a it's a great question that we that we ask ourselves right is what what, what kind of weather what all what are all the conditions that allow us to to launch and um and as we look at launching crews we take that very seriously and and look at it very extensively and and so in the case of um a, an actual crew flight we're not only looking at the nominal trajectory we are also looking at the launch uh path um at, in terms of aborts so we actually want, before we would launch the crew, we would want to understand the path and where they might land in an abort case. So we actually look at that weather as well. Other weather factors that could delay launches in the future. Absolutely. The, the number one most important thing is that we launch them safely. We get them to station safely. We'll take one question from here in the room, and then we'll go to the phone bridge. Chris, Chris Gephardt with NASA Space Flight. Um, I, I wanted to go back to the AFTS. So it'll be armed, it'll be functional, but you don't expect it to blow the Falcon 9 even though you're triggering an off-nominal mode with it. Am I understanding that right? And, and can you talk about why it won't trigger? Because I thought that was the whole point of having it there. So if something like that happened, it would blow the rocket. That, that's a great question. The, the, and that's correct. We're, we're, we don't expect it to blow up the rocket. Um, and it, it, that's by design. So um, because what we're doing is we're cutting thrust, and we're doing what we call thrust termination. So as soon as Dragon leaves the launch vehicle, um, we, we go into thrust termination. Falcon just stops. Um, and so then we've done all of the analyses and understanding where we th what, what could happen to it, what we think, we'll, you know, where, where would it fall to, if it's going to break apart, where do the pieces go. We do that. We work with all the agencies because, you know, again, public safety is also very important. We want to make sure that it's, you know, going to fall down to the right places. Um, and so we've assessed that deeply um, and, and, and know that we can, we can do this with thrust termination. We don't need to use FTS. Um, so, so is that standard for all crew missions? If you had a failure on the booster that was a thrust termination event, it wouldn't trigger the AFTS? Or is this just specific to this test? My understanding is is that this is we're flying like we we're testing like we fly, so I, I believe that yes we would we want to make sure that the most important thing again is is that the launch escape system works and that we're getting the crew away from Falcon as quickly as possible, um, and then as important is also the public safety. So we will always assess what's going to happen with Falcon um, after a launch escape. Um, and make sure that we're making the right choices in terms of what happens next. And now we'll go to the phone bridge. First up, we have Dave Mosier from Business Insider. 
Um, thank you for taking my question. I really appreciate it. Um, so I want to circle back to this particular failure mode that you're testing. This is one of, of many modes, as you said. It, it, I'd like to hear more about the explanation or, or why this particular profile was chosen. Was it, was it the hardest? Was it going to give you the most data? Maybe a bit of both. And then um, also about the data collection, which you mentioned, is there, are there plans to sort of deeply record the Falcon breakup? Thank you. Okay, I, th I think I, I think I heard the last part as well. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different triggers that we look at. Um, you know, there's 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 location trigger, GPS. There's um, you know understanding velocity and accelerations um, on the vehicle as it's excel as it's ascending. Um, um, there's understanding just the different uh, forces at work. We're looking we're looking for anything that's off nominal, right? There's there's actually many many different parameters that we're that we're looking at and we're assessing. Um, those launch those launch escape triggers have actually been under assessment for many many years um, and working closely with NASA um, and actually other government agencies to understand what all could happen and make sure that we that, that, that we would escape at the right point in time. So um, I can't really give you a specific list um, of what they all are, but there's there's many of them and it has to do with anything that's off nominal about the behavior of Falcon. And then we set the parameters for many, many different uh, metrics and, and, and set the thresholds for launch escape. Um, and certainly we will also be looking at uh, Falcon. Um, the primary objective is, is Dragon, but we'll also be paying attention to what Falcon's doing tomorrow. So we picked, we picked this test condition. I mean, we went through and jointly assessed, you know, what we thought would be kind of the best test for us to do as a joint team, right? And picked that particular time frame because it was a stressing test for us. It's a, it's a very, um, you know, it's an area where we could collect a lot of data on the overall systems, and those are all part of the, um, the kind of the factors that we weighed together to determine this particular test case. And now on the phone, we have Robert Perlman from CollectSpace. Hey, thank you. Um, what is to become of this dragon after this flight? If it's recovered successfully, uh, is it being refurbished for future use or being retired? And um, is there any interesting or commemorative items on board acting as ballast? <laughs> reveal all his secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you all of my secrets. Um, no, so. Um, uh, the dragon, uh, as I mentioned, it's a it's a it's a full crew dragon, um, you know, and our expectation is to be able to recover it well, um, and we'll assess we'll assess what what it looks like afterward. Um, there are a lot of forces in going through a, a launch escape. We want to make sure that that uh, dragon, if it was uh, um, something we could uh, refurbish and use again, we would look at that certainly. Um, but we'll need to assess that afterward. Um, and in terms of any goodies that are um, you know hidden in dragon. Um, you know, everybody always wants to do that, but I think we, we make an effort to focus on the test and make sure that we're, we've, we've loaded the Dragon with the sensors that we need to get the data that we need. That's the real treasure. We're going to take two more phone questions and come back in the room. Uh, we have next up Eric Berger from Ars Technica. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my question is for Kathy. Can you talk about what happens after this test, Kathy? Um, are there additional um, parachute tests or things like that, or is it kind of now paperwork and analysis and, and sort of making sure that everything, all the data you get, kind of sets them up for a crew mission? Maybe just walk me through the timeline now. After well, I'll, I'll, I'll get started, and Benji can fill in if I miss anything. I mean, I think, I think the big activities, obviously, this is a big activity for us to get through this test. Um, this, is, this is a validation test, so obviously, you know, your launch escape system has to cover all kinds of scenarios. And so um, this test is just one to make sure that all of our models and everything else, all the data that's anchored to all those tests that Benji talked about before is, is you know, operates the way we we're expecting it to operate. So going through, getting this test done, us both, you know, going through the data, making sure there's not any surprises is going to be, is obviously a big milestone for us, Eric. Um, we do have some more shoot tests to do, system level tests. I think so far that the, the upgraded system that the SpaceX folks have been developing has been operating very well. Um, and actually, um, the upgraded shoots are on this, on the in-flight abort test too. Um, so this is another, we keep talking about all the great things on this test, but us getting another system level test on the in-flight abort test is, is another great test for us. 
We are still working through paperwork and everything else, but as we say, it's not just paperwork. It's really all making sure the teams have reviewed all the data from all the work that the SpaceX guys have been doing, along with um, work that the NASA team has been doing to make sure that you know we're in sync on on where the systems are and certification of the system. We are really human certifying these Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9. And so um, us stepping through that together and making sure that we've dotted all the I's and crossed the T's before our uh, crew demonstration flight is very, very important. So we've got, we've got work to do, but honestly, getting this test behind us is a huge milestone. And now we'll go to Tim Bernholtz of course. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for taking time to do this. Uh, just a quick follow-on about the test profile. Uh, how fast will the vehicle be going when the launch escape system is triggered? And what kind of analysis do you do to compare that to when it may be triggered later in flight? Uh, we mentioned the Soyuz case. That happened, I think, uh, a lot later in the, in the flight profile. So how do you know it will work very much faster at a higher altitude? Thank you. I'll admit I didn't completely follow it. I think I heard how fast the vehicle will be going when we initiate launch escape. Um, it'll be a little past uh, max Q. Max Q, I think, is at about uh, 1.8 Mach. Um, and so uh, a little faster than that. Um, but I, I, I don't know the exact speed at which we're going. I know that um, it's about 84 seconds in. But I may have missed the other part of the question. I think it's, it's how do you know? You know, obviously, you know, we talked about this is just one test point. This is a test at a particular time for the launch escape system. You know, really our, the, the escape system, what we call our, you know, having the abort capability is really um, available all the way up until we get to station. Um, and so we go collect all that data from all those tests that Benji is talking about and you put it into our Monte Carlos and make sure that, um, that we are verifying that the crew will be safe if we're executing a board all along that trajectory, right? And so this is just one data point. You know, we say this test is very, very important because it really shows that the systems work together at this particular data point, and it's a, it's a very strenuous data point for us. Um, but there's a, all those system level tests, those ground level tests, and all of that Monte Carlo and GNC work that we do is really what then really certifies our board um, capabilities. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I, I, I think that that's exactly right. I think probably one of the most important things we're getting out of this test is the interaction between the vehicles, right? Um, um, until uh, Dragon is you know deployed safely away from uh, Falcon in orbit, um, it really is like a single vehicle, right? These, these two vehicles are, are talking together. The flight computers are fully integrated. We develop them that way. Um, the people that work on them, you know, are often cross over and work together on them. They, we, we test them on the test tables. We have, you know, the full inner workings of Dragon and Falcon is all the electronics boxes and the, and the, and the, the software is all run uh, many, many times, 24 hours a day at our facility running different scenarios. Uh, making sure that these vehicles will always work well together, but there's nothing like actually doing a flight test in environmental forces to see what's going to happen. And so that's one of the key things that we want to get out of this. Chris from the Washington Post. Um, hey, Benji. A question about the fate of your beloved thrice-flown uh, booster. Uh, you said it could tumble, it might come apart, you mentioned the fire. I mean, is there a possibility that it could actually explode if people are watching you know, from the beach, should they be prepared for that? And then also, because you usually recover your vehicles and don't ditch them, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about any mitigation you're doing in terms of environmental impacts. Thanks. Sure, absolutely, Chris. Um, it, so, you know, it's the, again, the, the second stage will be uh, loaded with propellant. Um, there'll still be quite a bit of propellant in the first stage. Uh, we expect there to be some sort of ignition and, and, and probably a fireball of some kind. Um, you know, whether I would call it an explosion that you would see from the ground, I don't know. We'll have to see what actually happens. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised, and that wouldn't be a bad outcome if that's what we saw. Um, in terms of the debris, um, absolutely. You know, one of the key things that we're always looking at is, is working with the right agencies and the right groups to make sure that we're protecting the environment, we're protecting the public, and we're doing the right things. So we've assessed all of that. We've assessed what we think the maximum possible debris field is. 
Um, and again, our, our teams will be standing by ready to go um, recover as much as we can safely possible and, and then basically make sure that the, the environment is safe. Tim, uh, the Emily astronaut, uh, for probably for Kathy and Benji, uh, can you run me through, uh, speaking of hyperdolic fluids, you know, when is it actually prepared on the vehicle and, and loaded up on the vehicle? At what point in the procedure is it actually armed? And at, or I guess you said it armed at, you know, T-minus two minutes before fuel up, but when is the actual uh, hyperdolic loaded up on the Dragon? And, um, and on recovery, how does the recovery crew and potentially astronauts, how do they know the environment's safe from hyperdolic propellant? <laughs> <laughs> well, Dragon's loaded about a week out, yeah, right? Exactly. So um, Dragon's usually loaded about a week out, right? And then, and obviously then transported over to the hangar, right? So there's a Dragon land, right? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> so no, um, yeah, yeah. Usually, usually about L minus two weeks is when we decide that it's good to go loaded. And like Kathy said, so roughly in that time frame, kind of in a week. Before, you know, after, after we've made all the decisions to go at about one minus two weeks on a mission, then we're going to go and load Dragon uh, with the propellant. So that's already been done. Um, and then and we do that in, in the Dragon processing facility that we transport it over um, to be um, integrated with Falcon. Um, all the while that you're loading hyperdolic propellants, all the time that you're dealing with a, a loaded vehicle, you go into a, a large set of safety protocols. Um, that people take very seriously, and you also have a lot of these detectors um, that, that allow you to detect the hyperdolic propellants. Um, and so all through the, the processing process and, the, and, and the, the pre launch process, we do that. The same thing on recovery. Um, we we want to make sure it's a really good question. You, you do care about that. You want to make sure the crew is safe. You know, they've gotten all the way to the water. You want to make sure they're not going to have some exposure that isn't good. Um, and so the same thing. We've got sensors and detectors um, and a lot of process and a huge amount of analysis and ground testing, uh, mechanical ground testing, to show that the structures are able to take the forces and contain anything and, and that you wouldn't have a problem. And this is a huge practice session for us, right? So. Um, we're really, that's why the, you know, the recovery crew is out there. There's NASA folks on the recovery boat too. We're all following along to make sure that we're understanding how you, we would work together to go um, follow through the procedures, make sure the procedures are checked out before we go get ready to go fly crew. One of the cool things is the crew actually gets to, you know, do that kind of practice where we actually, we practice recovery, they go out, we have a practice dragon that they, that we put in the water and and we take them out, and they've, they've practiced, and other people have run through the processes and steps, too. We have time for just a few more questions, so we're going to try to get as many as we can in the room, and we'll go back to here. Hi, I'm Ken Chang, New York Times. Uh, this is a question for Kathy. You spoke about how important it is to have an in-flight abort. Um, Boeing is not doing that with the Starliner, and so you won't have the data point of the interaction of the Starliner with the Atlas V. I was wondering if you could just talk about the tests and analysis that you've done so you had the same level of confidence in that spacecraft. So um, I think the one thing about commercial crew program is um, we are allowing each of the providers to kind of propose their testing and and verification closeouts in the way that best helps them. You know, I think the SpaceX folks have proposed their strategies for closing out the requirements. That includes this particular in-flight abort test. The Boeing guys proposed. A different way. There's advantages for having the pad abort test and being able to anchor your models and your systems in different ways. And so, um, the good thing is each of them have their pros, have their pros, lots of pros. And so, um, we, as long as it's meeting our overall strategy, we allow the flexibility for each of the providers to be able to propose what makes sense for their system. Hi, uh, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Uh, for Benji, can you update us on where the Demo 2 vehicle stands in processing right now? Has it left the factory in Hawthorne? I understood there was a, maybe a thermal vacuum test or something going on with it. Uh, can you update us if is that, that, is that done and when it could be delivered to the Cape and maybe the earliest it could be ready to launch with uh, Bob and Doug? Sure, absolutely. Uh, it's coming along very well. In fact, we just recently completed the heat shield mate. Um, where we uh, attach the heat shield to the, the spacecraft, um, and uh, and we're on track for uh, for completing the vehicle and delivering it uh, around the end of this month um, from uh, from Hawthorne down to the Cape. 
Um, and we'll have, we, there's a number of checkouts and tests that we do as we go through that process. And we're going to go to Joey Roulette for letters. Um, thanks. With SpaceX having already conducted a, in, a pad abort test and uh, static fires, can you tell me what value, what data you get out of this in-flight abort, you know, going through the stresses of the atmosphere and on the rocket that you wouldn't normally get in um, simulations? And then for uh, Benji, um, you said the anomaly report is complete. Can you kind of give a summary of what new hardware is on this um, Crew Dragon that wasn't on it before the anomaly happened? Thanks. Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, everybody likes tests. We, you know, the more things, the, the thing, the thing that's, I think, really great about SpaceX is they have a, they have a lot of hardware to test, right? And so, um, I don't think NASA ever, um, doesn't do a test that a provider, you know, proposes to them. And, and, um, I think what's been great about this is SpaceX folks, it's, it's in their philosophy to continue to test. I think that's where they gain their confidence. I think when they, they propose this, as we said, they propose this really under ICAP, which as folks know, that's many, many years ago. And it was, you know, a big where they thought that they had a lot of experience based on cargo, on launch and entry of spacecraft. But this one area that they hadn't really been able to kind of expand on their capability was with you know, a launch with escape systems, right? And so it was their unique, it's kind of what we talked about before, with their unique capability and where what was right for them, they, under the ICAP Space Act Agreement, had said, hey, we would like to use your investment to expand that capability, right? Um, so uh, we're very happy. I, I think our teams love it that we get to use this as a way for us to, you know, be able to practice and work towards our crewed mission. You know, there had been some debate within NASA and, and SpaceX about do we want to close out the SAA early, do this test two years ago, and we said no, let's let's do this when it's the right time, not and and look at it, especially after they did, they ended up winning one of the CC TCAP awards. They came in and said, you know what, we would really like to um, have this in flight. A, you know, a abort test when we're farther along in the system. So I think Benji and I have now been like on our 34th or 35th quarterly review on my Space Act agreement because we've really just been waiting and holding and having this Space Act agreement milestone when it was the right time for them to conduct it. We have time for two more questions. We're going to go to Ken Kramer and then we'll go to Emory Kelly. Ken Kramer, thanks for uh, Space Up Close and Rocket Stem. Thank you for doing this, and hopefully everything goes great tomorrow. My question is about the Super Draco engines, uh, Kathy and Benji. What, why are you confident that these engines will work now and they will not blow up in light of the anomaly? What changes did you require? What tests did you require that SpaceX carry out to prove it's not going to blow up because astronauts' lives are at stake and the space station is potentially at stake too. Thanks. So, I mean, I think a, a big test was a static fire, right? But along with that, we've done, and Benji can talk about this more, we've done tons of system level tests with the, with also with the Super Dracos themselves. And then we've done lots of tests to really understand how the system operates at, at, from a fluids perspective, which was which was data that we learned out of the anomaly investigation. We've learned a ton out of this anomaly investigation. And so I think the team, the great thing about it is that team has been able to, our teams, both NASA and SpaceX, have been able to work in parallel with the anomaly investigation team. And as the team was learning new data, be able to roll this into upgrades to the design and also roll it into our understanding of how these, you know, high flow um, prop systems work in this area. Um, so I think we, we're light years ahead in understanding how these particular systems operate right now. And really, you know, the, this test is another important step in us clearing the system for crewed flight. I don't know, do you want to add anything, Benji? No, I, I think the most important thing is that we took the time to do the investigation. 
that we did it right. We did it in close partnership. I mean, NASA and other groups were part of our, our investigation team and board. Um, and some of the changes that we've made, um, you know, I think are, are, are really critical to the system. And part of the investigation is we, we learned things that nobody knew in the industry before. Um, and, and we've been sharing that information. We plan to share a lot more of that information with the industry. Um, and and we've, we've implemented changes due to that information. Yeah, we've learned. We've all learned. NASA's learned. SpaceX has learned. This is data that will be important for anybody out there to have to be able to um, build safer systems. It's not going to happen again. We are doing everything we can to make it not happen again. Test, test, test. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, Emery Kelly with, with Florida Today. I, I just want to pivot to the uh, other crews out, out in the ocean while, while this is happening. How long before you, you give them a break? Uh, three attempts, four attempts? Uh, when, when do you kind of bring it back in and then and then try again? What's the balance there? That's a great question. You know, it, it is really important to always talk about all the crews working on a launch, right? And, um, um, and, and the ground team and the recovery team and the boats and everybody everywhere, including just the operators sitting on consoles, they have to, we have to watch their sleep and make sure they're getting enough sleep. So we, we have strict rules about how long people can be on shift um, um, and how long and, and you know, what they need to be, including at work, like there's on shift, but then they're still kind of working and now you can't do that. You need to go home and, and get some sleep, go back to your hotel, get some sleep. Um, the same applies on the boats, um, and so people are out. Um, would they have accommodations on the boats as well? So often, once the the fleet goes out um, within a certain set of, of opportunities, they'll stay out. Um, um, but they have the accommodations they need and the training they need to stay out there. But they still have to follow shift rules and make sure that folks are getting enough rest. I heard the cook is really good, so that's, that's <laughs> always a selling point. <laughs> Well, that's going to wrap it up for us here. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for the briefing on SpaceX in-flight abort test. We'll have live coverage starting about 15 minutes prior to the test, uh, so you can follow us on social media or online for updates about the launch times, which right now we're targeting the broadcast to begin at 7.45 a.m. for an 8 a.m. launch. Thank you very much, and have a good day.